All right, hope everybody is well. I am popping on here with you guys. Just got this book, um, His Life is Mine, Saint Sophrony. It is a uh, rather short book that was recommended to me, and I read from uh, the introduction, and it's really short. It's about seven pages, so I felt compelled to kind of just share it with you guys. Uh, really resonated with me a lot. Uh, saint Sophrony is one of the most recent saints. Um, he reposed in, uh, on July 11th, 1993, the Holy Synod of Ecumenical Patriarch glorified him as a saint on November 27th, 2019. Um, I'm going to read from this, see if this resonates with you guys as well. Uh, I'll read from the back, uh, the back cover here. Contemplation, prayer, spirituality. These words have become popular in our day among those despairing at the banality and emptiness of the contemporary scene. But popular as well are a myriad of pseudo-spiritualities each offering its own shortcut to spiritual satisfaction. His life, his mind is a refreshing contrast. The book deals with prayers and especially with the Jesus prayer of Orthodox monasticism. It is not, yet it is not simply a presentation of techniques. The book is permeated by the awareness that prayer is not just the cultivation of a particular spiritual state, not the investigation of an abstract idea or dissolution in an anonymous whole, but an encounter with a personal being. I am, demanding in turn our growth in personhood. As remarkable as the book is its author, Saint Sophrony. Like a good plot, his life has proceeded from possibility to probability to necessity. From marked success as a painter exhibiting in the great Paris salons after the Russian Revolution to a brief period of study at the Orthodox Theological Institute in Paris, to Mount Athos, the holy mountain of Eastern monasticism, where he spent 22 years. First is a disciple of St. Siluan, St. Siluan in the Russian monastery of St. Pantelemon, and for the final seven years as a hermit in the desert, quote-unquote desert. He finally moved to England and founded the monastery of St. John the Baptist, which carries on his legacy. Well, maybe I'll read. I read the introduction, but maybe I'll start here from chapter one and kind of get some new material with you guys. Uh, maybe I'll read the, oops, Sorry, maybe I'll read the introduction another time because um, it really was wonderful, rather short. Let's see how long the first chapter. Oh, the chapter's real short here. So I'll read chapter one here. Knowledge of God. O thou who art, O God the Father, Almighty Master, who has created us and brought us into this life, vouchsafe that we may know thee, the one true God. It's the quote at the beginning. It starts out, the human spirit hungers for knowledge, for entire integral knowledge. Nothing can destroy our longing to know, and naturally our ultimate craving is for knowledge of primordial being, of whom or what actually exists. All down the ages, man has paid instinctive homage to this first principle. Our fathers and forefathers reverenced him in different ways because they did not know him as he is, quote unquote, he is. Some, surely they were among the wisest, set up, quote, an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, close quote. Even in our day, we are continually made aware that reason per se cannot advance us over the threshold to the, quote, unknown. God is our only means of access to this higher knowledge if he will reveal himself. The problem of knowledge of God sends the mind searching back through the centuries for instances of God appearing to man through one or other of the prophets. There can be no doubt that for us, for the whole Christian world, one of the most important happenings recorded in the Chronicles of Time was God's manifestation on Mount Sinai, where Moses received new knowledge of divine being. I am that I am. Jehovah. From that moment, vast horizons opened up out before mankind, and history took a new turn. A people's spiritual condition is the real cause of historical events. It is not the visible that is of primary importance, but the invisible, the spiritual. Perceptions and ideas concerning being and the meaning of life generally seek expression and in so doing instigate the historical event. Moses possessed of the scripture culture of Egypt, oh, I'm sorry, possessed of the supreme culture of Egypt, did not question that the revelation that he was so miraculously given 
came from him who had indeed created the whole universe. In the name of this God, I am, he persuaded the Jewish people to follow him. Invested with extraordinary power from above, he performed many wonders. To Moses belongs the undying glory of having brought mankind nearer to eternal truth. Convinced of the authenticity of his vision, he assumed his injunctions as prescripts from on high. All things were affected in the name and by the name of the I Am, who had revealed himself. Mighty is the name in its strength and holiness. It is action proceeding from God. This name was the first ingress into the living eternity, the day spring of knowledge of the unoriginate absolute, as I am. In the name of Jehovah, Moses led the still primitive Israelites out of their captivity to Egypt, in Egypt. During their wanderings in the desert, however, he discovered that his people were far from ready, despite the many miracles they had witnessed, to receive the sublime revelation of the eternal. This became particularly clear as they approached the borders of the promised land. Their faint-heartedness and lack of faith caused the Lord to declare that none of those impregnated with the spirit of Egypt should see the quote-unquote good land. They would leave their bones in the wilderness, and Moses would encourage and prepare a new generation more capable of apprehending God, invisible but holding all things in the palm of his hands. His hand. Moses was endowed with exceptional genius, but we esteem him more especially because, because he realized that the revelation granted to him, for all its grandeur and validity, was not yet complete. He sensed that he who had revealed himself was the, quote, first and the last, that there could be no one and nothing before him or after him. And he sang, quote, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth, close quote. At the same time, he continued to pray for better knowledge of God, calling to him out of the depths, quote, Shew me thyself as thou art, that I may know thee. God heard his prayer and revealed himself insofar as Moses could apprehend, for Moses could not contain the whole revelation. Quote, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And while my glory passeth by, I will cover thee with my hand, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. That's from Exodus. That the revelation received by Moses was incomplete is shown in his testimony to the people that, quote, The Lord thy God will rise upon unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Unto him you shall be hearkened. You shall hearken. Also, and the Lord said unto me, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Close quote from Deuteronomy. According to the Old Testament, all Israel lived in expectation of the coming of the prophet of whom, quote, Moses wrote. The prophet par excellence, that prophet, close quote. The Jewish people looked for the coming of the Messiah, who, when he was, when he was come, would tell them all things. Come and live among us, that we may know thee, was the constant cry of the ancient Hebrews. Hence the name, quote, Emmanuel, which being interpreted as, is God with us, close quote. So for us Christians, the focal point of the universe and the ultimate meaning of the entire history of the world is the coming of Jesus Christ, who did not repudiate the archetypes of the Old Testament, but vindicated them, unfolding to us their real significance and bringing new dimensions to all things, infinite, eternal dimensions. Christ's new covenant announces the beginning of a fresh period in the history of mankind. Now the divine sphere was reflected in the searchless grandeur of the love and humility of God our Father. With the coming of Christ, all was changed. The new revelation affected the destiny of the whole created world. It was given to Moses to know that absolute primordial being is not some general entity some impersonal cosmic process or suprapersonal, all-transcending non-being. It was proved to him that this being had a personal character and was a living and life-giving God. 
Moses, however, did not receive a clear vision. He did not see God in light as the apostles saw him on Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor. Quote, Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Close quote. This can be interpreted variously, but the stress lies on the incognizable character of God, though in what sense and in what connection we cannot be certain. What Moses concerned with the impossibility of knowing the essence of the divine being. Do you think that if God is a person, or is person, that he can be eternally single in himself? For how could there be eternal metaphysical solitude? Here was this God ready to lead them, but lead them where? and for what purpose? What sort of immortality did he offer? Having reached the frontier of the promised land, Moses died. And so he he appeared, he to whom the world owed its creation, and with rare exceptions, quote, the world knew him not. The event was immeasurably beyond the ordinary man's grasp. The first to recognize him was John the Baptist, for which reason he was rightly termed the greatest, quote, among them that are born of women, close quote, and the last of the law of the prophets. Moses, as a man, needed obvious tokens of the power and authority bestowed on him, if he were to impress the Israelites, still prone to idol worship, and compel them to heed his teaching. But it is impossible for us Christians to read the first books of the Old Testament without being appalled. In the nature of Jehovah, all those who resisted Moses suffered fearful retribution and often death. Mount Sinai, quote, burned with fire. And the people were brought, quote, unto blackness and darkness and tempest, to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which they could not endure. Close quote. It's from Hebrews. It is the opposite with Christ. He came in utter meekness poorest of the poor with nowhere to lay his head. He had no authority, neither in his state nor even in the synagogue founded on revelation from on high. He did not fight those who spurned him, and it has been given to us to identify him as the Pantocrator, precisely because, quote, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, close quote. Submitting finally to duress and execution. As the creator and true master of all that exists, he had no need of force, no need to display the power to punish opposition. He came, quote unquote, to save the world, to tell us of the one true God. He discovered to us the name of the Father, the name of Father. He gave us the world which he himself had received from the Father. He revealed God to us as light in whom is no darkness at all. He made known the most exquisite mystery of all, that God is a hypostatic being, yet not one person, but three persons in one, the Holy Trinity. He gave us baptism, quote, with the Holy Ghost and with fire, close quote. In the light of this knowledge, we now see the path to eternal perfection. The world continues to flounder in the vicious circle of its material problems, economic, class, nationalistic, and the like, because people refuse to follow Christ. We have no wish to become like him in all things, to become his brethren, and through him, the beloved children of the Father and the chosen habitation of the Holy Spirit. In God's pre-eternal providence for man, we are meant to participate in his being, to be like unto him in all things. By its very essence, this design on God's part for us excludes the slightest possibility of compulsion or predestination. And we as Christians must never renounce our goal, lest lose the inspiration to storm the kingdom of heaven. Experience shows all too clearly that once we Christians start reducing the scope of the revelation given to us by Christ and the Holy Spirit, we gradually cease to be attracted by the light made manifest to us. If we are to preserve, if we are to preserve our saving hope, we must be bold. Christ said, quote, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He had overcome the world in this instance, not so much as God, but as man, for he did in truth become man. Genuine Christian, Christian life is lived, quote, in spirit and in truth and so can be continued in all places and at all times since the divine commandments of Christ 
possess an absolute character. In other words, there are and can be no circumstances anywhere on earth which could make observance of the commandments impossible. In its eternal essence, Christian life is divine spirit and truth and therefore transcends all outward forms. But man comes into this world as tabula rasa to, quote, grow, wax strong in spirit, be filled with wisdom, close quote. And so the necessity arises for some kind of organization to discipline and coordinate the corporate life of human beings still far from perfect morally, intellectually, and more important, spiritually. Our fathers in the church and the apostles who taught us to honor the true God were all were well aware that, though the life of the divine spirit excels all earthly institutions, this same spirit still constructs for itself a dwelling place of a tangible nature to serve as a vessel for the preservation of his gifts. The habitation of the Holy Spirit is the church, which through centuries of tempest and violence has watched over the precious treasure of truth as revealed by God. We need not be concerned at this point with the zealots who value framework rather than content. Quote, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, beholding the glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Close quote. The church's function is to lead the faithful to the illuminous sphere of divine being. The church is the spiritual center of our world, encompassing the whole history of man. Those through long ascetic those who through long ascetic ascetic struggle to abide in the gospel percepts have become conscious of their liberty as sons of God, no longer feel impeded by formal traditions. They can take general customs and ordinances 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 in their stride. They have the example of Christ who kept his father's commandments without transgressing the law of Moses with all its quote-unquote quote burdens grievous to be born. In Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit, God gave us the full and final revelation of himself. His being now for us is the first reality, incomparably more evident than all the transient phenomena of this world. We sense his divine presence both within us and without in the supreme majesty of the universe, in the human face, in the lightning flash of thought. He opens our eyes that we may behold and delight in the beauty of his creation. He fills our souls with love towards all mankind. His indescribable, indescribably gentle touch pierces our heart. And in the hours when his imperishable light illuminates our heart, we know that we shall not die. We know this with the knowledge impossible to prove in the ordinary way, but which for us requires no proof, since the Spirit himself bears witness within us. The revelation of God as the I am that I am proclaims the personal character of the absolute God, which is the core of his life. To interpret this revelation, the fathers adopted the philosophical term hypostasis, which first and foremost conveys actuality and can be applied to things to things, to man, or to God. In many instances, it was used as a synonym for essence. Substance is the exact Latin translation. In the second epistle to the Corinthians, in Corinthians, hypostasis denotes sober reality and is translated into English as confidence or assurance. In the epistle to the Hebrews, to the Hebrews, the term describes the person of the Father, quote, who being the express image of of his person, close quote. Other readings to be found in the same epistle are substance, quote, now faith is the, subs the substance of things hoped for, and, and very being, quote, the stamp of God's very being. So then, these three words, person, substance, very being, taken together impart the content of the Greek theological expression hypostasis to be understood as comprising, on the one hand, the notion of countenance, person, while on the other, stressing the cardinal importance of the personal dimension of being, in being. In the present text, the term hypostasis and persona are identical in meaning. So that is the first chapter. Uh, His Life is Mine, St. Sophrony. It's a very cheap book in terms of cost. Um, and that was the first chapter. The introduction is brilliant. Um, but I wanted to share that with you guys. So let me know what you think. God bless.